Hello and welcome to the New York Jewish Film Festival. Um, the festival is presented by the Jewish Museum and Film at Lincoln Center. My name is Indigo Sparks and I'm so excited to welcome you all to a discussion of the 2020 miniseries Labyrinth of Peace. I'm here with the writer Petra Volpe. Thank you so much for being here today with us. Thank you for having me. <laughs> yes, I understand you're coming to us from Berlin. Yeah, I'm in Berlin at the moment, but I live in New York, so. <laughs> but now I'm in Berlin, it's already getting dark here. Oh, wow. Well, gratefully we have this virtual platform, so yes. <laughs> we can engage in this conversation wherever. Um, so I just, I was wondering if you could start by just telling us how you came um, to make the series, what drew you to kind of tell these stories? Mm. Well, that was a, a very long process and, and involved a lot of research over many years. But it all started out when I was kind of, I, I wasn't really looking for this story consciously. So I was like surfing around, doing some research on another project. And I came across this term, uh, rat lines. And rat lines are the escape routes of the, you know, German war criminals to South America. And one of those rat lines actually led through Switzerland. And I didn't know about this, that, you know, that uh, the Swiss actually actively helped war criminals to escape to Argentina and, and other Latin American countries. And that there was some active help in my own country um, to, to help them escape. And, 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 and that led me to another story of how the Swiss invited Jewish refugees and survivors um, to come to Switzerland to recover from trauma and their you know, physical and mental trauma, uh, which was very much uh, an, a, an activity the Swiss government encouraged because they wanted to have a good relationship with the allies. So they invited these Jewish survivors. And I was very struck by this, fact that at the same time after the war there were Jewish refugees and survivors and their perpetrators and aggressors in the same country and it's a very small country Switzerland and so I took it from there um, and, and, and started to dig uh, deeper and deeper in, into post-war Switzerland's post-war politics and, and um, activities. Nice. Um, I'm curious what kind of the mood was um, on set. Uh, you're working with so many young adults and children um, on such a complicated um, and just entangled, very serious kind of subject matter. Um, and so when you were kind of bringing together the cast for the show, um, I'm just curious kind of like what the overall mood was and direction was around bringing everyone together to tell this, these stories? Mm. Well, I didn't, uh, I created and wrote the story and um, mm. decided not to direct it. And um, you know, me and producer, we chose a really fantastic um, director, Mike Scherer, who, who took on the whole show. And I just remember we talked a lot, especially about the, the young boys and how to tell their story, how to tell a story of, tra of such tremendous trauma and, we did a lot, a lot of research, like we read everything we could read and we tried to listen to a lot of interviews of survivors. So we tried to, you know, do justice, if that's even possible. I mean, it's the, the magnitude of the injustice that they experience is so extreme. You, you, you can only attempt to tell a story that, that comes from the right place and, and with the right heart and attitude. And I think that process of trying to capture the trauma, but to not exploit their pain and um, to find a way to show also how alive they were and how hungry for life they were. They weren't just traumatized children. They were also happy to be living. And all these many, many light layers of experience, we tried to do to depict them and I think this process we had as a director and writer when we started to, to talk about these these um, these characters I think he continued that with the young people um, on set also and um, that's all I can say I think he he was very very sensitive and very mindful 
you know, in, in directing them. But yeah. I think you would need to talk to him to, to know a bit more yeah. about how they actually worked, uh, worked on it. Yeah, thank you. I wasn't sure if you had spent any time. I just, on the set, I, I, when I watched the show, I, um, I felt that sensibility mm. that um, there was like a real, um, well, I, so I guess it's a combination of both coming from the actors and coming from the writing itself right? That yeah. there was like a real intention behind every single moment and every single word that was kind of expressed, especially from these young boys um, mm. and, and, and their struggle to express their trauma. Yeah. Um, and so what came up time and time again is kind of this question of belonging, right? Um, mm -hmm. And longing in one way or another, but it's not always clear what the motivations are for each character mm. um you know does Clara actually have feelings for Herschel or is she kind of being overwhelmed by her empathetic you know nature um and I just was curious about you know kind of like what you imagined if if those motivations were clear to you from the beginning or if that mm -hmm. was kind of a part of the labyrinth of like that process of writing and kind of discovering you know what they were mm -hmm. interested in yeah I think that's an interesting question um I mean the first thing I want to say is like the biggest sense of responsibility the hardest thing to write was the story of the the boys the survivors that that really weighed on me because I was like can I do I even dare to tell their story? Mm. Because it's like, if you, you know, I, 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 I know a lot, um, you know, I read a lot about the, the camps and the experiences there and Prima Livia and all of that. And if you know all these things and yet you can't really grasp, you know, you can't even pretend to know what any of them went through. But I think it's important to try and it's important to still tell their story and it's important to tell them with as much sensibility as possible. And I hope we achieve that. And the other thing about motivation, I think, I think people are not black and white, you know. I think they're all driven by sometimes contradictive desires and what they think and they are and who they think they are and who they think their moral values are is not necessarily how they act. And I think this is very universal. And they're also, it's also the depiction of a young generation, all the three protagonists, the two brothers and the woman, they all think they will do everything different than their parent. They think they start with zero. You know, they want to start with a clean slate. They want to do things differently. They have the best of intentions. But I think if you try to escape your past and if you don't face it, I don't think good intentions are enough. You know, you need more work on yourself. You need more consciousness. And uh, she's a good example. I think she's driven by wanting to be good, by wanting to be different, by, you know, doing right, something that was wrong. But she's also just a young woman. You know, she's naive and she does fall in love, but she also uses him. So it's a lot of things because that's who we are as human beings. I think I think even the the her husband, he... He doesn't want to collaborate with the Nazis, but then he gets tempted and all of a sudden it's about his own benefit versus the common good and justice. And you are faced with this question. And I think this for me makes the story very universal because we are all constantly faced with these kind of ethical and moral questions. It's not just their generation. We're living in the midst of a time where we have to make big decisions as individuals where we stand politically, ethically, morally. And that's what made, what for me was the bridge also to today. You know, it made them, it made the characters very universal. The fact that they, they weren't black and white and their decisions weren't simple or, or um, one dimensional. And that was very much the intention from the beginning. That's the way I like to write, or I think, art is interesting if it puts you in some kind of like emotional roller coaster where you also feel sympathy for a character but then you you also feel distance and sympathy and you start to ref reflect on yourself 
You know, yeah. you can't just say this is them and it's their problem. You start to think about yourself. How would I act in this situation? And how would I act in this situation today if I was faced with it? Definitely. I, I felt that uh, kind of like ebb and flow throughout the whole series for sure while I was watching it, especially with um, Henkele, who, I mean... <sighs> <laughs> You didn't have to break our hearts like that, but you chose yes. to. Um, yes. And that, I mean, it, it, his story and kind of his overall arc, I think really makes you start to imagine, right? How many children who were throw, thrust into this situation at such a young age mm. were, you know, forced to navigate these kinds of, you know, deep, dark feelings of trauma while also trying to be a kid. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that it was very surprising and shocking to me, his, his arc, but like you just said, it makes you sit back and question, what would I have done, you know, mm -hmm. with, with what I had, you know? Mm -hmm. I felt, you know, I had to take, I really didn't want to let the people off the hook, you know, and I felt he, I needed that end in his story to have a punch in your belly for the audience, because otherwise, I, th I think sometimes you need to, to take the story and the characters to an extreme to have the effect you want. And, and, um, and, uh, I think he's the most innocent character in the whole story. He's the, the smallest. He's mo the most submitted to everything what the adults do. Even, even Clara, she, she has such good intentions, but bringing him to this party was the most stupid idea, oh my God. you know, but she's yeah. also just 21 and she tried her best, but yeah. it's, you know, it, I think she's met like a lot of things are metaphors in, in the story and she, it's very metaphorical that she's also doesn't know how to handle, like they were really like, even, even the caretakers that I researched who tried their best, they were overwhelmed. You know, mm -hmm. these, these young people, they came with such extreme stories and they wouldn't show immediately, you know, it would be very hidden and the trauma would show in the most surprising or unexpected ways. And many of these young women and men who worked with them and tried their best were also overwhelmed or they didn't know, they didn't have any support or like there wasn't no, no psychologist around, nobody knew what right. to do, you know. And um, and I think that the, the hardest, it's, it, Yenkel's story is very hard because he's so little and he's so, there's really nowhere, no place for him to go. And there were thousands of children like him. And we sometimes forget, you know, the war wasn't over when the war was over. <laughs> it continued for a lot of people. And a lot of things still went wrong. Like there was a huge failure in Europe towards these survivors, not just Switzerland, but also other countries failed the displaced people. Nobody wanted them still. You know, nobody took responsibility and or just not enough people. And I really, I really wanted to show the consequences of that in, in all its harshness. I, um, I found the um, presence of the lakes and the water um, in the story, kind of connecting it to um, Pinkola and to be a metaphor in my experience of traveling through um, through the show and the series of, it seemed to me to represent possibility. Um, it seemed to kind of represent a restart, a refresh. I didn't know if that was something that was consciously um, intended or if it kind of was more about the overall landscape, you know, of Switzerland and um. Mm. No, that was very conscious. It's the scene, Herschel, and she, that's their place where they go. It's just a place of joy and innocence and purifying yourself and washing off the past. And so it's, 
it's it is what was very intentional to have this place for Herschel and Clara to go to, and for him to have this moment where he starts to talk about that he still wakes up and dreams like he thinks he's still dreaming he thinks he will wake up and he will be back in a camp and then he has this moment where he goes into the lake and it's a very he's also a young man he's a teenager basically he's 18 19 something like that and he's also just a boy and I think I wanted to give him this moment of joy in in the lake with the water um and uh, no, that was, um, but of course, there are a lot of beautiful mount, uh, mountain lakes in Switzerland. <laughs> so I didn't have to search too far. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> nice. Um, could you talk about the significance of some of the songs um, that were sung in the show? I had never heard any of them before um but yeah if you could speak on on that a little bit yeah i think the most important song is the buchenwald song that the boys sing together after their hike and this is an actual song of the buchenwald survivors that all the re refugees knew and um yeah it's I, I i really wanted to have it in there because it's something i think music was very important for um for for survivors and 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 people who had gone through this experience and it was also something that unified them and gave them solace and but it's an extremely sad song and it's a bit the way i put it the, the moment i put it it's like these swiss think let's take these boys on a hike it will do them some good yeah. that's the naivete they have he really thinks like the the leader of the camp, this man, he thinks like, you know, these boys just need to walk, walk it off, you know? And it's not because he's mean. I think he just couldn't, nobody could fathom, you know, what they went through. And then the counterpoint is that they sing this song and it starts to sink in for, for, for Clara and also for, for, for the, the camp leader that they come from a completely different world. The, the, the song has a very, you know, very melancholic and heavy lyrics, and and um, it gives them a hint, a hint of an idea what 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 the boys went through. So it was very important for me to have this song. It's also a tribute, you know, to people who survived this horror, and to let yeah. it live on. You know, it's the whole show is about not forgetting the story. It's about, um, you know, not not letting the past uh, sink into forget forgetness or what's the word in English oblivion I don't yeah, know yeah <laughs> yeah so so this song is part of it also it's a very powerful moment um I I think uh with kind of the overall um con uh, conflict between um the boys being Jewish and the conversation of religion coming up of all of these different men coming to the home and trying to reach out to them and kind of persuade them, quote unquote, mm -hmm. to their cause. Um, when they find out that they later on in the series, when they find out that they're being relocated to Palestine, um, the question of faith in God is introduced and it was was a moment that stood out to me. And it, to me, it kind of felt like, oh, um, this is, it's actually taken a little bit for us to get here. Um, we haven't really heard them speak too much, uh, the boys meaning about uh, their belief or what they're, you know, they're Jewish, but we haven't really heard them speak about like what God has done, what God has done, what God has done to kind of bring mm -hmm. them to this situation. And so, I, I was just am curious as to the timing, you know, of choosing to bring up that, that struggle of mm -hmm. where is he now? Um, mm -hmm. Cause I think sometimes when you watch films, you know, like that, like have that have a similar subject matter, it can kind of be one of the first things um, mm -hmm. that comes up, but it, that I don't, so I just, I, I'll stop talking and I'll let you. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think, you know, my research, I realized that it wasn't their 
top priority when they came to Switzerland. I mean, some of them wanted to celebrate Shabbat and, you know, have their rituals. And for some of them, it wasn't important, but it wasn't, it wasn't, it didn't take so much central stage in the beginning. And it became a big question when all these different directions of being Jewish or like also political um, question, like of, you know, being like going to, to Israel or not and stuff like that. Um, that's when it started to be, that's when it came up for them. Like they had to choose who to join. Some of them didn't want to join. They, if, what, what really struck me is that a lot of boys really loved that they were all together and there wasn't a difference and they wanted it to stay this way. They were very sad when they were separated because they felt like we can all live together. We don't have to be separated. We can all live our own truth and own religion without having the separation. And they actually appreciated that. And it made a lot of them like the, the big conflict came up when, you know, when, when these people came to the camp and wanted to draw them in this or this direction. And, and, and there were some like Herschel, for example, he, he lost his faith, you know, it made him, the, the experience in the camp made him lose faith in God. And he's like, what kind of God ha- can put us in such a situation? I don't believe in a God that's like this. Other boys were even more religious and really wanted to practice, um, you know, their, their, their belief. So um, I kind of took it from the research and, and went along um, and I didn't want to make it a big Thing from the beginning because in the beginning it's more about like how can we have simple things work in this camp which is depiction of the truth is that the camp didn't have enough soap they didn't have enough toothpaste they weren't really ready for them it was just a PR act de facto which is very sad and, and shameful they the Swiss wanted to you know shine before the allies and so we're taking them in we will take care of them and when they actually arrived in the camps, there wasn't even enough food, you know. And um, so in the beginning, all the boys are much more busy, like trying to say, like, can we please be fed? <laughs> like you mm-hmm. promised us education, you promised us food, you promised us a place to stay. And all of that isn't happening. That that was more their priority. Mm. Yeah, that's the scene with the photo shoot. <laughs> Yeah, I mean. that's also taken from reality. I didn't invent that. I mean, that's so ho- awful. You can't even invent it as a screenwriter. <laughs> like <laughs> reality, like my experience as a screenwriter is like reality is always more crazy and more like there's there's so much to be found in reality and some things you can't come up with, you know. And that yeah. was like this before and after shoot where they had to wear the prison clothes and then show like they're smoking cigars and there's a big basket of food that actually happened. They actually did that. Oh. Mm. And, and one of the camp uh, women, actually um, Charlotte Weber, who wrote a book about it, who was a very big inspiration. She was one of the camp um, mothers, camp mothers, they called her. She was very, very actively trying to do her best to, um, you know, make the situation for the, for the boys better. And she wrote a book about it. And she actually, you know, stepped in when they took the pictures and tried to prevent it. So was the mother-in-law kind of... She's um, inspired. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, so all the characters in the story, they're not, like, they're all inspired by real people. And there's mm-hmm. very often amalgam. Like, they're, like they're inspired by different people and I put them into one character for narrative reasons, but they're all like the whole story, everything is based on real events and real people, but it's fictionalized in us that the characters are, you know, melted together, that the time frame is a little bit more tight, like all these things didn't happen, you know, in just a few weeks, it happens over three months and, um, also the Nazi, like he's, he's inspired by a, a very big Nazi criminal who, 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 who brought a lot of money out of Germany into Switzerland and then managed to bring it to South America. And uh, also the factory, the, the Swiss actually invited um, 
Nazi scientists to help them with, with nylon and then claimed it's a Swiss product and they did launder Nazi money, but not in one, it's, it didn't happen in one company and I put it into one company. So I, I did a, a lot of consolidating and, and, and um, cons- focusing and that, that was the biggest work in, in the writing and, and creating the characters out of real people. Well, I think you did an amazing job. I mean, the the um, kind of like cadence of, which I've said this already, but I'll say it again, because I really feel this, is that the mm-hmm. cadence of, of the writing and um, the dialogue, along with the way that it was filmed, Michael did an amazing job. Um, yeah. It really like, it really brought, I think that these stories are hard. They're hard. Like they're, Mm -hmm. they're so hard to tell. And they're Mm -hmm. very, um, like you have to be very like gentle with the expression of it, but you didn't let us off the hook. Mm -hmm. Um, and I learned a lot that I didn't know. Um, and so I really commend you for kind of like being able to bring all of these stories together and then have it be articulated so beautifully in a way that resonated like emotionally with me a lot. Um, Thank you. So, (laughs) yeah. Um, So I guess when I'll ask one final question, which is through the process of creating this, um, we see each character kind of like find their own journey to their whatever their piece right may be um and I'm wondering what you kind of learned about yourself or if there was kind of similar experience with kind of closing up this particular project of yours um just reflecting back on if there's anything that brought you peace or that you learned or (laughs) <laughs> no I'm never at peace <laughs> uh, otherwise I would probably stop writing <laughs> um, no but it was definitely the biggest project I ever took on and it really it was like it was a, a burden also once I started this journey I couldn't stop and I was alone I wrote it wrote and created it alone in the end I mean in the end I had the director Michael was very involved and he was my sparring partner for the last and my producer, the three of us, they would read the drafts and send notes and I would write and I was just like in a, a little hamster in a wheel as just writing, 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 writing. And they were very, you know, I was very grateful to have them as my sparring partners um, because you lose distance also when you have such a huge story and so many storylines. Mm. And then it was really great when Michael started shooting, I was his sparring partner. So I would watch all the rushes and give him feedback. We would discuss things. And I was involved also in like, I watched all the edits, like all the the different drafts of the editing. Um, So I I was the one who had a little bit more distance. And so it was a really great collaboration. Um, But it's, but honestly, I, I feel like, I feel I told the story I really wanted to tell and it felt very urgent to me to tell this particular story. And there were a lot of people who said, when is the second season? We want to know what's happening to the characters. Why won't, you know, will there be another season? And I didn't want to make another season. For me, the kind of open ending, like, you know, it's not completely close to story um, was important because I think that's how life is. And, um, but I also didn't feel any kind of urgency to continue their, their, um, their, their stories, because I wanted to look at this particular time in my country. And, and also I wanted to spark a discussion in Switzerland about this. And we actually achieved, like the, the, the show was very wild, like it would have very high ratings and the people were very moved by it. And a lot of people got curious about this time because many people don't know anything about the time after the Second World War, which is actually a very important time. And so I think we achieved to make people curious and they also did, you know, connect the dots. They did, you know, it did change their perspective on there's a huge refugee crisis in, in Europe today. You know, so you can draw a lot of parallels. Um, But 
I wasn't at peace <laughs> and I probably will never be. <laughs> Uh, that's that's really the, the the my motor is to not be at peace and to continue to write and, and create stories. Mm. <laughs> well, well, thank you so much for mm. sharing this um, beautiful journey with us and educating all of us and also mm. just joining us for this conversation, even remotely. Thank yeah, um, thank you for uh, having me. And I hope a lot of people will watch the show and especially in my favorite city, New York. <laughs> so yes, mm. yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>